Welcome to Build Your Dream Network. I'm Kelly Hoey. I see people struggling to connect effectively all the time, so I created this podcast to help you master your network building needs. Whether you're seeking a new job, looking for a promotion, or scaling your business, you need a network, and you're in the right place to get the advice you need. And don't worry, my advice is real. It's actionable and practical because it's the advice I follow and is what has transformed my career from the traditional to the unexpected. So let's get started. I am so thrilled to have in the podcast booth today, Jen Johnson, who for readers of Build Your Dream Network will know appears on the expert case study, Be Purposeful at page 26 of my book. Jen, thanks for making it up to New York to be in the podcast with me. I am thrilled to be in New York with you today. So thanks for the invitation. So let's dial it back. I want to get a little backstory for, well, even for those who have read the book and read your story. You upped and moved from Texas to New York for a job, pretty much not knowing a soul. Correct. That's a really ridiculously gutsy move Mm -hmm. in any day and age. Um, And you had a really great job that you were in and an established name in the legal profession. Why did you take such a massive career risk? People ask me that all the time, and I I think there's a couple ways that I would answer that. Number one, I, I was raised by parents who are entrepreneurs. And we're always trying different things and did fi- ultimately find some things that stuck and they were very successful. So I think I had that as the foundation for everything that really gave me the courage to go. I obviously had their support as well. Um, but I would say for me, it was less about the career opportunity at that point in my life. And it was more about broadening my horizons. A few months prior to upping and moving to New York, I had just returned from Africa where I was able to spend some time with some folks who were very involved in the World Food Program based in Kenya, and it was life-changing. It it absolutely made me see the world differently. And I was from Texas. I am from Texas. And, of course, us Texans think everything is better in Texas. And and, bigger. And everything is bigger (laughs) and better in Texas, right? But I really just thought, "I, I need to get out. I need to go experience something different. I had been to New York City once when I was 15, 14 or 15 maybe, uh, but it had been probably 13 or 14 years since I had set foot in New York. And I applied for a job with a recruiter in New York, and that recruiter happened to be in Dallas and said, you know, can you meet for a few minutes in person while I'm there? I said yes. And she said, I'm actually looking to expand my business. Would you be interested in coming to work with me? And that's how it happened. And so it was because I was open to opportunity and I was interested in exploration Um, But I do think it was the foundation of my parents who had really given me um, that underlying courage to just keep pushing forward. Um, I loved my job. I loved the law firm that I worked for. I still love the firm um, and have very close relationships still from that. But it it was more about me needing to get out of my bubble personally than it was about a career move. But then it wound up being the best thing I ever did professionally. That's awesome. Let's dive into that more and let's also, okay, dive into this fact. All right. So you interview and land a job Mm -hmm. in New York. You haven't been here for 14, 15 years. You interviewed with your new boss while she was in Dallas. Mm -hmm. You were also starting a new line of business for her. So it wasn't like, hey, come and pick up these existing clients. Um, Talk about how you approached that challenge. At the beginning, I... um did not turn down any invitation to go meet anyone anywhere at any point. I went to every networking event. I was relentless. The business that I'm in, in still in is, is executive search, right? So I collect people for a living. Um, and so I was relentless about working the phones and getting coffee meetings and just asking anybody, will you meet with me? And I did that relentlessly probably for about a year. At that point, there was no networking event too large or too small or too far out of my way. I went to everything. And as you know, in the story in the book, you also were the person that took the mindset of, I want to be the person who gets invited back. And I just think that's just so important for listeners who may say, oh, I'll just go and ask someone for a coffee date. It's like, that's nice. You you ask someone for a coffee date. How are you going to get them to ask you back on another coffee date? Yeah, so I did the coffee dates and I did attending the networking events, etc., 
but I decided to become actively involved in the professional association that oversees the profession that I'm in, which is legal marketing. So the association's Legal Marketing Association and I had attended a couple of um, cocktail events and a lunch program. And at the second lunch program, I walked up to get my name tag and I said, hey, if you guys ever need help, right, let me know. And they were like, well, as a matter of fact, could you do the name tag table? And they couldn't get out of there fast enough uh, <laughs> to go to attend the lunch. And there I was at the name tag table. And you know what that did for me? I got to meet and shake hands and put a face with a name for all 84 people that showed up at that lunch meeting all of them in my industry, and then by association was linked with somebody who had a purpose with the organization, right? Even though it was a name tag table, I was somebody. I belonged there. And that's sort of the beginning of it for me in terms of my journey with that association. Well, I think that's such a great lesson for so many reasons. One, that no task is too small. And too many times people, they want the big role or they want, they perceive to be the glamorous one. And how can you, you know, people listening to this, how can they turn like the name tag table or being in charge of a distribution list or a telephone list or organizing a conference call? I mean, you can turn those into relationships. It's not just a task. Um, And I always think of your example, too. Every time I go to an event and they have name tags and particularly what's more like a self-serve name tag table. And I'm like, oh, wasted networking opportunity. (laughs) It's true. I will tell you there's there's two sides to this coin. The first is if you're going to do it, do it right. Be there. Be accurate. Be professional. Or don't do it at all because the people who say they're going to do something and then don't do it, it amplifies more so. The people who don't follow through, it amplifies worse than it does the other way around. So do what you say you're going to do or don't do it at all. Go all in or just don't. I mean, I've seen it backfire. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, what's your reaction? Because uh, both of us have seen this with professional organizations. Um, what's your reaction to people who shrug off involvement in industry associations? And how important, I mean, this is sort of two sides, you as someone who is highly visible within a professional organization, yeah. as well as being a recruiter. Um, how important is it to visibility and name recognition to be within those professional networks? So like with all of my answers, there's multiple pieces. Uh, So the first is I think people who shrug it off, there's probably an underlying issue where maybe they're introverted and they don't know how to become involved. They don't know how to ask how to become involved. They um, Maybe there's something where they don't perceive their value somehow. I mean, that's a psychological, you know, different conversation, but I think there's some of that. I also think people are busy in their lives, particularly people who have kids or other people in their lives they have to care for, and it's just another thing to add to the workday. I also think that there's people out there who see their role as a job, punch in, punch out, do what you need to do to get your paycheck and move along, and then there are people out there who see what they do as their career. And so people who are more career-minded are the great suspects, right, to go into an industry association. But people who shrug it off, I mean, I think there's a few people out there who are just arrogant and don't think that they can learn anything from anyone, which is, again, a whole other topic. But I think that the people who do get involved within their organization or their industry association, it can be so incredibly valuable. Again, it can backfire, but it can be valuable. And I think you have to pick your visibility. You have to pick it carefully. You have to make sure that the role that you take on within the association is in line with your professional aspirations, right? It can't go counter to that or else you won't be effective on either front. One of the things as a recruiter that we look at is people's visibility within their industry. Are they contributing to the industry, particularly those that are career-minded? Are they writing? Are they speaking? Are they teaching? Are they leading? What does that look like? And when we're not able to track somebody's career path and they're giving into the industry that they work in, it gives us some pause. It really, really does. And I think being involved in, in the industry that you want to have a career in is absolutely critical. I think so often people take, but they don't give. And if you want to have a successful career, it's important that you give back into the industry that you're passionate about. I know so much when I was in law firm management, you know, as I like to say, the whispered network of where there were opportunities and hearing about those before they had landed. If nobody knows, here, it's as simple as this. If nobody knows who you are, how can they help you? If nobody knows who you are, how can they think to recommend you or refer you, right? That's 
I don't know how to say that anymore. Pointed. I mean, if you, I don't know who you are, I can't help you. If you're there's, not visible, there's the mic I drop moment. <laughs> right? But it's true. And the thing is, people come around looking when they are let go from a job, laid off, things are not lining up, they're not happy anymore, and all of a sudden they want to do networking. I can see through that from a million miles away, and I don't want any part of that. Yeah. Right? I don't appreciate it when people want to talk to me whenever they need something, but when they don't need anything, you never hear from them. Right. Their perception. Yes. So, so one-sided, so transactional. And for me, one of the things that always frosts me is when people don't value the relationships and information and importance of their peers. Like that's one thing for <laughs> someone to come knocking on the door to you because they're, oh, Jen's a recruiter. She can help me out. But their peers in an industry, you know, they overlook those as having that kind of value. I'm really lucky in the industry that, that I live in, legal marketing. It's a very open, collegial, transparent group of people who are there to help one another. It's like unlike anything I've ever seen or experienced. And frankly, people that we bring into this industry from other professional services organizations, they come into the association and they're like, wow, everybody knows everyone. Why are we talking about RFP like strategies in a group setting? You know, because it's so hyper competitive. But in our industry, it's not like that. And I think that's one of the best things about this particular industry industry that I live in is that people truly are there to help each other. They're, um, and the people who leverage that are the most successful. Reminds me when, when I was getting into law, I wanted to make that transition into law firm management. Yeah. I went to uh, the industry and conferences before I entered. And just hearing that collegiality, yes. I'd almost want to say to someone who's listening to the podcast, if you were thinking, I'm going to move from the accounting industry into marketing in the legal industry, you know, what I'm hearing is people should go and suss out these networks and the difference in the behavior well before they, you know, even bother knocking on your door and with the gonna, resume. And also you'll learn something. I mean, I love perspective. It's my favorite. That word is my favorite word. I love learning from other industries and figuring out how to translate that back into my own industry. So you're going to go sniff out a potential new industry to move into. Great. You're going to learn something, too, while you're at it. So it's not a lost cause, yeah, yeah, even yeah. if you choose not to go that direction. You um, think about your own career. I mean, you went from, you know, sort of over a five-year period. You went originally from organizing the name tags to actually being the top dog in the... <laughs> In the industry, in that organization. Um, talk about, um, you know, how, how you go about doing that for someone who may be listening, thinking, OK, I mean, I've just sort of been a passive member and I've showed up at my, or, you know, industry or professional organization. Any kind of thoughts or observations on how you move into a top role and when you really raise your hand and say, I'm going to go for the big one? So I think within any industry uh, and I've had some exposure to other associations now that I'm on the international board of the Legal Marketing Association, we get to kind of see how other associations run and, and how their members behave, et cetera, for learning purposes for our own association. And I think that something that's common across all is that people think that they have to be asked, right? Um, you get these call for volunteers or call for leaders or call for nominations is typically how that comes out where people like me who are very active in the industry are looking for people to raise their hand and get more involved. And I think that most people believe that they need a tap on the shoulder or they need somebody that's visible in the association to say, hey, why don't you put your hat in the ring for treasurer or whatever? And it doesn't work that way, and it can't work that way. You literally have to raise your hand and say, I would love to learn more about becoming the membership chair. How would I do that? Well, you get on the membership committee. You, you chair uh, a project for the next year that is meaningful, and you give good reports, and then the next thing you know it, you don't have a choice because you're going to be the membership chair because you're next in line and you're contributing and people see that. But I think you have to raise your hand. You can't be shy. You got to raise your hand and say, I want to be involved. How do I do that? And that would be, frankly, as somebody who's on a board of an association now, I would welcome that if somebody was like, how do, I mean, I would find six places to put one person if I could. <laughs> Just Which, eager and love it. Yeah. Well, I'm saying yes, because it, I mean, you got a job to do and a family to raise. To, yeah, right. You can't sit there and worry about, you know, everybody else saying, hey, you should put your hand up Correct. for this. Yep. But you also, if you're going to volunteer, you've got to do it in a way that is aligned with your professional goals, right? So if you're a technology person, maybe don't do the treasury position, right? Or if, you know, maybe do something that's social media for the association or CRM based or something right. that aligns with that skill set. If you're, uh, you know, a finance person in your job, maybe nobody wants a treasurer job. That's the hardest one, I think. And so maybe that's the one you align with, but make sure whatever it is that you're doing, when you are taking time away from your family and your friends and your life to volunteer, that it lines up with your professional endeavors. 
adds adds value somewhere, not just to the organization. Correct. Otherwise, it's, you can become quite, I'm going to say, resentful or frustrated with it. Um, right. But also, too, you've, I'm going to ask you about this. You've been in and out of leadership roles within the same organization. Um, when do you do that? When do you step out? When do you step back in? Because, you know, we've both seen leaders who hang on too long. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, and sometimes you do need to, I want to say, fire yourself from a board or, or whatever else, or where, you know, you got to leave space for some other people, um, but you don't want to lose the connections because you have created that profile. How do you do that? So I believe in seasons, and there's a season for active engagement, and then there's a season for um, engagement that may be not hyperactive. Um, and then there's a season to step away. And I think when you're building your credibility in an industry, that's the season for active engagement. I think when you are in a season of your life, like I have been where I've had children and I stayed engaged on subcommittees, and then you know there's a time that you need to step back, which is I think if you get too close to an organization and you, you know I've seen too much, uh, if you get to a place where you're thinking negatively about your involvement, that's the time to step away. Um, but it's got to be seasonal. It has to be based on where you are in your life and how much you can actually give. Because again, going back to what I said before, if you're not going to do it right, don't do it. Yep. And so people will understand if you need to take a moment to, to have life happen. But again, there's other ways that you can stay involved. You don't have to be the president of the board of directors. You can be co-chair of a task force looking into five-year roadmap for the future of the organization. There's all kinds of ways to stay involved. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first off, this is so great to have you here in person. This is IRL. <laughs> I, we are As the IRL. Kids say, they say. Uh, and, and to get you to expound on your story in the book. And I have millions of more questions. So I'm going to tap you to come back at some point in the future so we can chat some more. Um, but for all uh, listeners of the podcast this week, we challenge you to go and take a look at the organizations you're involved with. And are you a member in name only? Is there more that you can do to raise your profile and contribute to the organization? Or is it time to pass the baton? Take a look and uh, I'll see you back here next week. Thank you for listening to Build Your Dream Network. Stay connected and don't miss a networking insight by subscribing to the podcast. And while you're there, I'd love you to rate and review the show too. Are you looking for more networking advice? Pick up a copy of my book, Build Your Dream Network. It's your guide to modern networking. I'd like to hear your networking questions, tips, and ideas. Connect with me via my website, jkellyhoey.co. You'll find links to all my social media accounts, plus a contact form to email me your questions. I'm Kelly Hoey. And I'll be back again next week to tackle your networking challenges.